So I'm curious, those of you who've been a part of the Temple family for a long time, how many of you noticed the table off to the side during worship? Stick your hand up for me. How many of you thought, I wonder how Doug's able to worship Jesus this morning with a table on the stage? It's a prop. It was there on purpose. There's a purpose for it. I love how many people came up to me before church and said, do you want me to get that table off the stage before you have a coronary? I feel so known and loved today. Uh, So this is Hunter. If you guys don't know Hunter, this is Hunter Wood. I agree with all of that. Um, Hunter is a a product of our ministry, graduate of Temple Christian School, was a student leader, a student athlete here at TCS, and a few years ago started a conversation about, hey, I think I'm called to ministry, and what might that look like, and what would, could I have a role here, what would that look like, and so um, this past summer, he served in a ministry internship with us with Nikki Briley. Uh, Nikki was going into her senior year of Bible college, and Hunter was going into his freshman year of Bible college. And, um, and so it was, it was a great experience. Um, God keeps growing and developing this young man. He's a student at Texas Baptist College and Southwestern Theological Seminary uh, here in Fort Worth. And uh, God's grown him as a communicator. He's on our teaching rotation uh, at Temple Student Ministry and um, has spoken here in chapel. And Lord Willen is going to be preaching this summer uh, one of our Sunday morning services. So excited how God's using him. After his internship this summer, uh, I sent him and Nikki a questionnaire just to kind of get the juices flowing about think through this past summer, what'd you think? And one of the questions, I think it was actually the second question I asked was, what was the most surprising thing in your experience of your internship this summer? What was the thing that surprised you the most? And I expected this deeply spiritually insightful thing like, the brokenness of the need and the people of the hurting and the pain. Like, you know. And he said, tables. He said, I can't believe how many times we have to get tables out, set tables up, break tables down, put tables away, just to get tables out again for the next thing. Uh, And so I thought it was fitting that he'd help me set up a table this morning because we're gonna talk about tables in our text this morning. Y'all give Hunter a hand as he goes to have a seat. (laughs) Grab your Bibles if you would this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one underneath the seat in front of you. Uh, If you don't own a Bible, that is our gift to you today. Please keep that. Uh, But we wanna invite you to join with us in our tradition here as we hold up our Bibles and say a creed together and a prayer together before we jump in to the words on this page. So let's hold it up in the air. And even if you're at home right now, say this out loud. Let's declare it together. The Bible is the word of God. The truth of the Bible will change my life. Lord, open my heart and awaken my mind and give me grace to respond. Change me for your glory and my joy, amen. Thank you so much, please turn to Acts chapter six. We've been working verse by verse through the book of Acts. We have finally made it to chapter number six. Um, And I will tell you this, last week uh, we rounded out chapter five. We covered verses 12 through 42. If you're not a math person, that's 30 verses last week. We're only covering seven this morning. Um, But that doesn't mean you're going to get to lunch any sooner. Um, Covering just seven verses this morning in Acts chapter number six as we continue to work through this incredible book together. So uh, chapter six, verse number one is where we'll start. And I'll tell you, we're going to talk a little bit about verse number one, and then we're going to kind of speed through the rest of the text. And then we'll go back and kind of make some observations about the text as a whole. Verse number one. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number... A uh, couple observations here. Uh, one's important to make note of, and the other one I think is just interesting. Uh, Jesus commanded his followers before he left planet Earth to go make what? Disciples. So it's pretty cool that this is the first time we see that word used in the book of Acts. Now, they were making disciples before now. They just hadn't written that word down, and I think it's just pretty cool that we're seeing here the vision that Jesus had for humankind is being fulfilled. That's why I think it's worth noting. Uh, The word disciple makes its first appearance and then actually appears uh, a few times just in these uh, handful of verses this morning. Uh, 
But it says they're increasing in number. And the question is, what's the number? And the answer is, we don't know. But a lot, <laughs> right? So on the day that the Spirit was poured out, the day of Pentecost, how many people came to saving faith in Jesus? Anybody remember? Acts chapter 2, 3,000. Yep. Acts chapter 4 is when the guy who hadn't taken a step in 40 years plus is healed. The gospel is proclaimed. And another 5,000 just men. That time they didn't count souls. They just counted dudes because that's how, unfortunately, it worked sometimes back then. So we don't know how many came to Saving Faith that day, but just men alone was 5,000. And then we have multiple of those summary statements that I keep telling you about where it like, the, the book of Acts, time goes like an accordion where we'll draw out a story and then speed up really quick and then draw out a story. And so in those speed up really quick verses we've looked at, all of them have had the same thing. Bunch of people chose to follow Jesus. So we don't know how many, but it has to be at least 10,000 by now. And the reason that's significant is scholars think there was only around 40,000 people who lived in Jerusalem total at this time in history. So we're like a handful of months into this thing called church and at least 10,000 of the 40,000 people who call that place their home have been arrested by the gospel of Jesus. Isn't that incredible? That's pretty amazing. Um, and so as it's growing and growing quickly, the rest of the verse, a complaint. Man, we only made it to chapter six of the thing called church. And church people are already complaining. It's awesome. A complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. I want to talk through a couple things here. Uh, first, we'll talk about this idea of widows and, and what's the story there. And I know that we know this, but we don't want to leave this Going without saying, the way the world worked then, and by the way, the way the world works in much of the world today is that women were not treated with the value and honor that they are worthy of as image bearers. And so they weren't allowed to own real estate in most cases. They didn't grow up wondering, what am I going to be when I grow up as a young woman? What do I want to go off to school and study? There's essentially no form of formal education for a woman in this day and age. And so if her husband passed away, there was no social security system in place. There's no federal loans or grants. There's no uh, a functional Salvation Army kind of program. She didn't have a 401k she could draw from. And there was no such thing as life insurance. And so there had to be people of compassion if she didn't have family who was wealthy, extended family, to help take care of them. And here's the thing. While there's a different system in place in our culture, what still is the same today is we've got plenty of people around us who are financially vulnerable, right? Um, if you draw a five-mile radius around our campus here, we have a higher ratio of single moms in our corner of the city than the Metroplex does in general. And so they might not be widowed, but man, they're, they're struggling financially to provide for their families. The reason we just kind of instituted this local vision mission is because there are people right here in our zip code that we're going to Kroger with or getting gas next to, God help us, that are struggling, that are vulnerable financially. And then this complaint about these needs being met is between the Hellenists, and the Hebrews, which for us kind of doesn't mean anything. So it's important to understand what's implied here is kind of a form of bigotry or prejudice, racism almost, even though both of these groups are Jewish. At this point, the gospel's not advanced past the Jewish people. Hebrew is the language of the Jewish people, but it's the culture as well. Again, if you've been around the Bible a long time, you know this stuff. It's just important to recap here. This is during the time of the Roman occupation of Jerusalem. The Roman Empire is ruling most of the world, but specifically where Ecclesia is starting. 
Jerusalem, the city of God, the people of God. And so because of that, there's oppression, there's some persecution, there's difficulty for the people of God. And so there's at least two groups of Jewish people, those who've said, we can't leave. This city belongs to the people of God. We have to stay near the temple. We have to maintain our traditional worship. We have to protect our culture. We have to protect our language. And then others said, this is really complicated. And there's other places in the region, specifically in the Greek-speaking regions, where it will be more friendly for us to start over. The Hellenists are the Jewish men and women who've left Jerusalem and kind of absorbed into a different culture. They're now speaking the Greek language. They've accepted some of the Greek customs and cultures. They're not being as specific about the purity of the traditions. And, and here's how, how one pastor summarized it when I was studying. I thought this was really good. We can call the Hebrews the traditional conservatives, and we can call the Hellenists the progressive liberals. And the beauty of this text is the clear teaching of the Bible that Jesus loves both. Jesus loves conservatives and liberals. If you're here this morning and you're a Republican, I want you to know that Jesus loves you. If you're here this morning and you're a Democrat, I want you to know that despite what some of us might have said to you in the last election, Jesus loves you. If you're an independent, I want you to know that Jesus loves you. If you're a libertarian, I want you to know that Jesus loves you. If you're like, I don't identify with any of this mess, Jesus loves you. And Jesus expects his people to love each other. It's not just that Jesus loves you. That's not enough. The people who wear his name are required to love one another too. Well, that feels like a burden. Yeah, some of y'all are hard to love. <laughs> this beauty here that, that the conservatives and the liberals, Jesus loves you and he cares about you. And he, here's what I want to say this morning. As the people of God... We are supposed to be the bizarro unicorns in the culture who actually believe that you can love someone even if you disagree with their worldview. We're supposed to be the weirdos. We're not supposed to be offended when people don't love us because of their worldview. We know our worldview will be offensive to them. If Jesus was offensive to the world, then those of us who don't look that much like him are surely gonna be offensive to the world but we're supposed to love the people who are offended by our worldview. We're supposed to be the weirdos. We're supposed to be the people with enough social and emotional maturity to know you don't have to agree with me for me to love you. I'm not threatened by you, and you're not my enemy. I might believe that your worldview has been hijacked by the enemy, but you're not my enemy. As a matter of fact, if I love you and treat you with some honor and some dignity, maybe you'll see the truth of Jesus in me and, that's be, and be set free from your hijacked worldview. Amen? Amen? This is the call of the people of God. Well, that's verse one. Verse two, and the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables, time out. They're not saying that the tables are beneath them. They're clarifying roles because things have grown so much. This overnight exponential growth where people who didn't know anything about the name Jesus are brand new believers in Jesus. I'm just here to tell you, if 10,000 people get saved in the next couple months, I'm gonna need some help moving tables. In the meantime, I don't mind grabbing the other end of the table, let's be honest, right? We're not running 10,000 around here. But this is not them saying that tables are beneath them. They're saying we have a certain calling in our role, but tables need to be moved. Does that make sense? Here's the phrase that I use a whole lot. I don't know if I've ever used this on a Sunday before. I use the phrase a whole lot to describe people. They're the kind of person who will grab the other end of the table. Meaning, when we have an event and I'm moving tables as your pastor, 
Every now and then I feel the other end of the table get lighter and I look up and there's one of you. You feel me? And so sometimes I describe y'all behind your back as the kind of person who will grab the other end of the table. That's essentially what they're saying here, just on a far bigger scale than we are. Does that make sense? So they're not saying it's beneath them. They're just saying, we need some help. Verse three, therefore, brothers, pick out from among you. We're gonna circle back to the end, but that's huge. I wanna say this before we move on. The word brothers here is brothers and sisters. Sometimes when the Bible uses he or she or brothers, it's actually a gender neutral term. And if any generation, any culture should understand gender neutrality, it's us, right? Uh, Gender confusion. This brothers is everybody, which is important because when it comes to the service of the body, that's not just a role reserved for men. When it comes to jumping in and being a leader, That's not just reserved for men. So we do not know this. Maybe if you've been in church your whole life, you've heard this is when deacons began. I would say that sentence differently, and I would say this might be when deacons began because the text doesn't use the word deacons. So this might just be another form of eldership maybe because Stephen clearly was a preacher. He's one of the people fixing the step in this role. We, we don't know for sure what this role is, but if it's deacons, it's important to notice the whole brothers and sisters part because in the Bible, there are female deacons. They're called deaconesses, right? And so uh, this, is, this idea of jumping in and being a part of the solution is not just for guys. Pick out from among you. Now, this specific moment of, of being ordained, he does specify that everybody picks seven men, but look at this description, of good repute, men with a good reputation. And here's the description, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom who will appoint to this duty. And and, and here's the thing, the the question is, is that three descriptions of who we're supposed to choose? They have a good reputation, they're full of the Spirit, and they're full of wisdom. Or is that really just one description? We define a good reputation as full of the spirit and full of wisdom. I don't know which it is, but that's, that's really good. <laughs> you know what I think of when I think of full of the spirit and full of wisdom? I think of Ron Stroud. I'm not bashing any other leader. He's just the first name I think of when I think of that. When I first sat in my first leadership team meeting as the pastor of the church, I was frustrated with Ron that he wouldn't answer more quickly. I asked a question, it's been 10 seconds, why haven't you answered? Because that's how my personality works. I answer before I've actually thought about the answer. And then at the end of the meeting, when we're about to close in prayer, the pattern now is that Ron Stroud goes, can I offer a thought? And it's always the best thought any of us have had the whole meeting. Is that true, guys? Come on, let's be honest. We're just waiting on Ron. Like, let's just sit here quietly and drink coffee and wait for Ron to, full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit. All right, we gotta keep going. Verse four, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, which sounds like a dinosaur from Jurassic World. The Prochorus has gotten out. Anyways. And Nicanor, which sounds like a city in Lord of the Rings. And Timon, which is Pumbaa's friend. <laughs> and Parmenas, which is a cheese you put on spaghetti. And Nicholas, Santa's in the Bible. (laughs) Saint Nicholas of, oh no, he's a proselyte of Antioch, not the North Pole, sorry. Now, here's why I said stuff about each of those names, because I want those names to stick in your head for a minute, because we're gonna circle back to that. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And then verse seven, one of these big summary statements again, and the word of God continued to increase 
And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of even the priests became obedient to the faith. I want to draw out a few observations about this story this morning before we're done today that I think are crucial to understanding what ecclesia is and what it looks like. And it's crucial to examine, do I really fundamentally believe the gospel? Here's the first observation. Disappointments happen. Failure happens. And that's okay. Notice that the the complaint is, our widows aren't being served. And the leaders don't come together and go, yes, they are. They're the guys that like gave testimony to this. Luke interviewed them and they went, yeah, we dropped the ball. If we're broken people, doing life with broken people in a broken world, stuff's gonna be, wait for it, broken. Broken. I got to tell you, I find so much comfort in Acts chapter 6, verse 1. We are like, in the grand narrative, looking at it from a 2,000-year perspective, we're like 15 seconds into the story of church and people are already disappointed. That gives me so much comfort. Like, these are the guys who experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Like, they're bringing out crippled people to get in their shadow. They're speaking and people are being healed. Thousands of people are coming to saving faith when they preach and even they disappointed people. Huh, I ain't never healed anybody. I'm gonna be a huge disappointment. Whew. Do you feel me? I think it's so fitting for our theology because our whole narrative of faith begins with falling short. Our whole story is the victor. The one we just sang, your name is victory and mine isn't. The victor met me in my failure and rescued me from failure. That's the whole gospel story. The problem is we get rescued in our failure and instantly feel the pressure to play games to pretend like we got it all together. We put that pressure on ourselves and we put that pressure on other people and all of a sudden the people who were rescued in their brokenness are supposed to pretend like we're not broken. What in the world have we done to this? Like if we really believe the gospel, that means we begin by knowing we fall short. So of course, when we're doing stuff, it's gonna fall short and here's what's awful. It's not just that we kind of act fake. It seems like the faker somebody is, the more we promote them and give them bigger platforms and buy their books and go to their conferences and read their blogs and, and stream their talks. And then when they fall underneath the weight of the pedestal we put them on, we're, we're like, what a failure. I am so disappointed in them. I'm never putting somebody up on a pedestal again. And then three days later, some athlete accidentally mentions God. And we're like, oh, give them a movie deal. Make them the new hero of the day. We create these monsters and then we slay them. We, I'm not going to say we. Be honest with you. I want to have it all together. Anybody else resonate with that? I don't. I'm so glad I don't have to pretend. I'm so glad I have a savior who is victory. So, if disappointment and failure is our reality, happens to us, right? Then for sure disappointment happens within the churches made up of us's, right? If I fall short, then a church where I'm a member is gonna fall short, right? 
I'm constantly hearing from people. They're like, dude, our last church disappointed us so bad. The band and the music and the kids' ministry and the facilities and the website and the social media and the everything and the parking and the, and the it was, I'm so glad I'm at Temple. Let me just rip the Band-Aid off. We're just like them. Our disappointments might look different, but we're no better. Do you know why? Because we're made up of you. <laughs> there you go. It's just us. And this might sound super jaded. I, 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 think, I think Lance is about to be disappointed that I'm going to say this out loud. <laughs> when somebody comes to me and visits our church and the first thing they do is start dogging the church they came from, I always tell Lance, it won't be long that they'll leave here dogging us too. And he's like, oh, be positive. He's such a positive guy. And it's funny, the longer he's been in full-time ministry, the more he's like, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> We're just beating him down, robbing him of hope. Um, I'm not saying that genuine church hurts aren't real and that there's not been cover up of secret sin and failure and whatever. I'm, I'm not talking about that heavy stuff. We'll talk about that in a minute. I'm talking about they just disappointed me. Literally, that's our origin story. Our genesis is we fall short. Welcome to the party. And here's what else I would say. Well, pause. Let me just say this. If there's not space to fall short, then we either think way too highly of ourselves or way too lowly of the gospel. If I mess up and it's crushing, it's either because I thought I was a way bigger deal than I actually am, or I have a really small view of the beauty of God's restorative grace. Do you follow that? If failure is the end, then you apparently thought you were perfect. Or apparently you didn't realize how perfect Jesus' love for you was. Failure doesn't define us. It's just the beginning of the story. So if, if we fall short, and therefore the churches that are made up of us fall short, that also means that good, godly leaders fall short. Like these guys... I read one pastor. He's like, can you imagine the conversation of who elected these guys as leaders? Jesus? He handpicked them? Well, where did they go get their theological training? At the University of Jesus. Do they even know the Bible? They're literally writing the Bible. Like they speak. People take notes. Oh, it's authoritative. Canon of scripture. Like... They love people. They've been appointed by Jesus. They're walking in the spirit and they're human. And they're like, yes, stuff falls through the cracks. That's why we need each other. We have blind spots and we will have blind spots until the day we get full sight when we see him as he is. That's why we need each other. This what. <laughs> This thing called Ecclesia is not about us finding a new hero of the month. There's already a hero, and his name's Jesus. I promise you, if I haven't yet, I will disappoint you. I pray that I won't sin against you, but I'm sure I'll let you down. And, and the problem is, what happens is a lot of people when they get disappointed with living in community with the church, they just bounce to another church now in our culture. They're like, I'll go start over somewhere else where I don't know anybody and they seem great until I get to know them and they're just as big of a mess as me. And unfortunately, that's not just what church people do in the U.S., it's what pastors do too. That's why the average tenure of a pastor is three to five years in the U.S. As a pastor stays long enough to build relationships and people are disappointed in them and they're like, 
I deserve better. I'm out of here. If we're actually going to stick with it and do life together, we're going to have to be committed to move through the disappointments. Amen? Well, here's how to do that. So if, if we're going to disappoint ourselves and one another... And if we're going to be in churches made up of people just the same way, with leaders who are the same way, here's the beauty of this text. We have a choice of how we will respond to those disappointments. We're not a victim to those disappointments. We have a choice to either respond in the spirit or in the flesh. How cool is that? We get to choose what happens next. Let me real quick give, give a couple contrasts of spirit and flesh. I can either respond in arrogance or humility. Arrogance says, I'm better than that, or I deserve better than that. Humility says, yeah, I saw that coming because I'm a work in progress too. Amen? Amen? I get to choose in my disappointment to respond with, I'm better than that, I deserve better than that, or, yeah, I'm smack dab in the middle of my sanctification too. Like ours is a whole faith system built around the fact that none of us have arrived. And it's so crazy that religion has become this fake plastic, I am perfect. No, our faith system is like, yeah, I'm, I'm like hopeless and desperate apart from Jesus. And I'm so much worse than you think I am. <laughs> this past week, I heard um, a video clip that went viral from Pastor Matt Chandler. And it was so good, I almost just like showed it this morning and stood off the side and watched it with you. But he, he said several things that I think are worth repeating. The disciples didn't bail on Jesus because of Judas. Because their eyes were on Jesus, not one another or themselves. That's good preaching. We don't read here that they left and started their own cult. If we're honest, if I'm honest, I got way more Judas in me than I see Jesus sometimes. Doubt and selfishness in my agenda. To that person who's just constantly bashing the church and everybody in the church, I would just lovingly, pastorally say to you, who do you think you are? Do you think you're any less broken than the people you're dogging on? Like for real? And here's my challenge. Then go start your own church and let's see how long it stays perfect. Now I'm not being hateful. We can respond with arrogance. I deserve better because I am better. Or we can respond in honest humility. Yep, I'm smack dab in the middle of being conformed to the image of Jesus too. And I ain't there yet either. Number two, we can respond with gossip. Or we can respond with healthy communication in a healthy setting at the right time and place. Because it looks like this didn't start off well. The text is not super, super clear in the original language, so we're kind of guessing, but it looks like when it says that the complaint arose against, most scholars think that means stuff was brewing for a minute before it made, it there, made its way to the apostles. Does that make sense? Not that they came to them in an appropriate tone, at an appropriate time and place. No, they started gossiping. Um, and I do want to say this about gossip, and I, I don't think we have an epidemic of, of gossip in this ministry. I've actually, I've been in church my whole life. I've never been anywhere that I feel like there's less of that than there is here. 
Maybe y'all are just really good about being quiet when you whisper. But if that's the case, keep it up. I don't want to hear it. Right? And neither does anybody else. So I, I, I'm not addressing what I feel like is, is, a, is a negative thing here, but I am going to preach about it because I don't want to see it become a negative thing here. I'm grateful for the fact that I feel like this is a community that is for one another. Not trying to pull one another down and tear one another down. And I'm telling you, I'll fight for that culture. Gossip is a disease. So we can respond in arrogance or humility. We can respond with gossip or healthy communication. We can also respond by either judging motives or by assuming the best. Because here, what's implied in the text is not just that they were like, oh, hey, some stuff is falling through the cracks. It's, oh, we don't matter to you. Your, our culture is not as important to you. It appears that they tried to judge their motives and 90% of the conflict that exists in marriages and in homes and in churches is because we think we know people's hearts. And according to the scriptures, I don't know my heart. I sure don't know yours. But at least it seems like once a week I hear somebody say, this is what they did, and I know why they did it. You do? Okay, Holy Spirit, enlighten us. Here, here's what I actually think. You think you might know why they did it. And you probably formed that thought based on a jaded, bitter spirit towards them. But the gospel always assumes the best. If we're gonna play the motive game, the gospel always assumes the best of someone. I don't know why they did it, and I don't think they know why they did it. Does that make sense? We better be careful not to assign motives to our disappointments. G.K. Chesterton said this, idolatry is committed not merely by setting up false gods, but also by setting up false devils. Form of idolatry is making a devil out of somebody because they were human. So we can respond. In arrogance, I deserve better because I am better. Or humility, I'm smack dab in the middle of my sanctification too. We can respond with gossip or healthy communication. We can respond by judging motives or believing the best in them, or we can respond in self-righteousness or gospel dependence. So again, coming back to uh, what I heard Matt Chandler say this week, our whole gospel narrative is that we are dependent on God's grace or else we're toast. Amen? So to demand that I receive grace but not to extend it to anybody else is the height of self-righteousness. I deserve the benefit of the doubt. I don't ever extend it, but I sure want it. I want grace for me, justice for everybody else. That's self-righteous. Here's what Chandler said. To punt on Jesus because some Christian you know isn't up to your standard is a dangerous place to stand before the living God. We love each other because of the gospel of grace. Not because we like each other. Not because we have the same hobbies, habits, or worldviews. Chandler actually asked his congregation, how many of you know some Christians you don't really like? Raise your hands. <laughs> I'm not, not going to do that this morning. It might hurt my feelings. It seems like the trend today is to just dog the church as though church disappointment is new to our generation and our culture. Church disappointment has always existed. We just have social media now to blast it. 
Now, to, again, to be clear, I'm not talking about not holding leaders accountable to covering up sin and, and abuse of power. No, 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 no. That's just the other side of fake. And that's equally hideous. I just think it's time we're real with each other. We're all a work in progress. I, I, I say this a lot. Almost my entire life, I've either been a pastor's kid or a pastor. And here's the deal about the bride of Christ, y'all. I've seen the bride without her makeup on way more than I have prettied up. Most of my encounters with the bride has been with bedhead and morning breath. <laughs> right? And yet the God who's rescued me did not spare his own son for her. So I don't plan on giving up on her. Because I ain't any better off than any of the parts of the bride I've met so far. Can we just be real? I've gotten to where either fake I'm awesome or fake everybody else must be awesome for me. It, I'm allergic to it now. Some of you have heard me say this. I've just had a belly full of fake. Being in church as long as I've been in church, I've had a belly full of fake. Here's reality. We're not gonna do everything perfect. Thank God we have a savior. Thank God we got each other. J.D. Greer said about this complaint that arose, he said, this must be seen as a significant threat to the church, not just in her beginning, but today. Nothing is used by the enemy of the bride more effectively than gossip and bitterness and resentment and judgment and self-righteousness. We've seen attacks already on the church. We've seen the, the political and religious system attack the church with persecution. We've seen an attack from within the church where actually the name Satan is used, that he messed with some leaders' heads who were hypocrites. And then now we see this new potential of an attack of disappointment. A spirit of grumbling and complaining and judgment and criticism and gossip kills more churches than persecution ever has. Do you agree with that? Here's why this is worth saying today. Because there's, I did actually, I plan on this being like, we're gonna cover all of chapter six this week until I started doing more research on this. And I'm like, I think this stuff needs to be said, not because I perceive some major problem in this church community, but because I perceive this as such a problem in the culture today, and if we're truly gonna shine as light in the darkness, right, th then we've gotta push back hard against the spirit of criticism and division and gossip and grumbling, right? Amen. Thank you, Steve. Here's what else I see in this text. In this broken world of broken people doing life with other broken people, God is in the business of raising up leaders to grab the other end of the table. Like that's what he's, that's what he's working at. The reason I tried to bring attention to the names of these seven people is dependent on the scholars that you read, because I don't know, I'm not that smart. So when I research their names, Either all seven of these names, or at least six of the seven, are Greek names, are Hellenistic names. They were like, hey, there's a problem. And the apostles were like, we're gonna delegate you authority to solve the problem. Isn't that awesome? You know what the church really should do? Thank God you just volunteered to start that. I, I've gotten to the point now when somebody says, hey, you know what y'all really need to do? I either want to say, whose salary are you fixing to pay? Or what are you ready to do about it? Love you. 
God raises up leaders among them. This laying on of hands is a, a sign of delegating authority. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later as we move forward through this book. I would say this about God raising up leaders though. Notice the leaders did not demand leadership. Leadership is not a right. It's a privilege that's designated by an earned reputation. One of the reasons that for all of our leadership positions here, you have to have been a member here for at least a year, is there's supposed to be time where a reputation is earned that I'm full of the spirit and full of wisdom, right? And so somebody can walk in here and be like, I was the head deacon in my last church and I wanna be on the, de- hold, hold on, Tiger. Let's talk for a minute, right? But God's in the business of raising up leaders. Uh, one of the phrases, oh, good grief, it's later than I realized. Y'all, are, hang with me here. Um, when I was working in real estate, when I was bivocational, which means I had a real job and ministry, um, my boss uh, was an amazing guy. Um, he was a lot older than me. Um, he was an amazing guy, had had an amazing life. Um, he had multiple black belts in something. I don't remember the name of it, but in one of the martial arts, he, he had, he, if he happens to watch this, he'll probably be deeply offended that I don't remember which martial art it is because I know that's a big deal to you martial arts people and we're scared of you, sorry. Um, and he talked a lot about his time in Vietnam when he was a young man. He, did, he told me some really actually horrible stories about his time in Vietnam. His role um, was special ops, and most of what he did wasn't with weapons. It was hand-to-hand stuff in the dark of night, going into a place. It's really awful stuff. But the story that I heard him tell almost once a week is he tells the story about when he landed in Vietnam and they're screaming at him to get off the helicopter and they scream at him to get in a single file line because they have to report to their commanding officer. And he said, just what you picture from the movies, it was a pole tent that had a back to it but no sides or front. And there's a table and the CO is sitting at the table And there's a stack of the paperwork of these new recruits. You're standing in alphabetical order and he's pulling the next one and he's got to sign you in. You're reporting for duty. And when you come stand before the table, he said, you're standing at attention, you're looking straight ahead. And the CO had taken a crate. Supplies had been in it or or weapons of some sort. He had taken an empty crate. He tore the lid off and he wrote in the bottom of the crate, You're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. And then he hung it from the top of the tent so that when he said, I'm standing there with my 18-year-old self, I can hear explosions going off in the distance. My knees are knocking together. I've never been this scared in my life. And I'm just staring at this phrase. You're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. And he said, with every single one of us who crawled off that helicopter, he did the same thing. He never looked up. He never asked us what our name was. He just kept signing whatever he was signing. And he said, well, what's it gonna be? And then in good, typical Marine fashion, part of the solution, sir, thank you, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, whatever, you know, that whole thing. And 50 years later, that guy, every day I heard him say to somebody, you're the part of the solution, you're part of the problem, right? And I see that in this text. I see this, hey, We're fallen people. Stuff's going to fall through the cracks. And the apostles are like, then we want to help you be part of the solution. We want to help you be part of what God's up to. We're going to delegate authority to you to be part of the solution. Because ministry in its purest form is not supposed to just be done by clergy. Ministry is done by family. And there is plenty of opportunity for ministry to happen here. For us to jump in and grab the other end of the table. And here's why. I love this. Church, ecclesia, true biblical church is never, ever supposed to be a one-man show. Thank God. Because every time we see it become that in our world, 
when that guy falls, the ministry collapses. This church is almost twice as old as me. And whenever God calls me home, she will continue to endure until Jesus comes because this place ain't about me. If I fall over dead of a heart attack tomorrow, which is tightly as I'm wound, is not unbelievable, is it, Jason? Like, I'm just telling you, this thing better be bigger than me. I don't want to pour my life out for something to be about me. This is us trying to reach our community with the gospel of Jesus together, carrying one another's burdens together, helping each other uncover those blind spots and walk towards Jesus together. This, this ends with one of those summary statements, right? Verse seven, the word of God continued to increase. The number of the disciples multiplied. This is another one of those summary statements. And, and something amazing is about to happen. We're gonna take a one week break from the book of Acts next week for Easter. We're gonna talk about his mercy enduring forever. We're actually gonna talk about Palm Sunday next week a little bit. But when we circle back to this, an amazing transition is about to happen. Because if you remember, Acts 1.8, I said, is the outline of the whole book that Jesus, that will speak Jesus in Jerusalem where we live, in Judea and Samaria, to the areas around us, and then to the end of the earth. And here's what, what the rest of chapter six is. Chapter six is walking out to the edge of the diving board, and the rest of the chapter is beginning to get a bounce, and then we're about to dive. The gospel's about to finally go out past Jerusalem here in just a minute. And I don't think that would have happened if everybody didn't jump in and grab the other end of the table. We're gonna take a, a break from Acts because of Easter Sunday. And I'll just say this, there's a, a card in your seat, we encourage you. And don't, there's two ways to think about Easter as a church attender. I wonder if we'll have any guests or I wonder who God wants me to bring, right? Two very different approaches. I can think, man, I hope the Easter egg hunt goes well. Or I can say, I wonder where else there's needs for volunteers. I wonder how many other tables need to be set up. Ah, Hunter's got them. <laughs> and the same with Good Friday. Who am I bringing to come drink of the cup and take of the bread together on Good Friday. We invite you to jump in because we believe God's in the business of redeeming broken stories and transforming them into an identity of the one whose name is victory.